that we have to acknowledge is that we have imprints, roots, and natures that are not the gospel. Okay, that's step one. If you think, oh, no, I'm okay, I don't need any roots, imprint, roots, and natures change, then you're probably in heaven. Kind of attempted a joke at the beginning, but I guess it wasn't funny. <laughs> but we have them. We have them. Okay, so we need to discover that. And these imprints, roots, and nature, you've heard the message already. Um, they're from a long time ago. Okay, the most important ones happened a long time ago. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3. So in Genesis chapter 3, you have Satan uh, tempting Adam and Eve. The same temptation is the, is the way that he works today. Um, God is lying. You're not going to die if you eat the, of the tree of the fruit of knowledge, good and evil. You're not going to die. When you eat it, you're going to be like God. Um, that's the lie that they bought into. Um, that's where the original sin started. They were separated from God. Not only separated from God, um, they became under Satan's dominion and control. Okay, and we call it the three S's, right? This is the fundamental problem. This is what's imprinted in us. At the very core of our being, we want to be like God. We don't want to be um, in God's provision. We don't want to be in enjoying God's love. We want to be on our own. Uh, and that's, that's how the world works as well, too. And if we, understand, we, if we don't understand this deeply and correctly, um, we're not going to understand the uniqueness of the gospel. Um, sometimes when I you know, share gospel to children, I think that it's a good sign of where you're at, I guess, where we're at with our understanding of sin. And a lot of times we ask children, have you sinned before? Because, you know, try to get them to admit that they're a sinner, right? And there's, you know, some kids are so cute, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, and then we say, the next question is, well, have you ever lied? You know, have you ever stolen? You know, and we try to get them into admitting that they sin. But we think of sin in such a physical level. The Genesis 3 problem isn't, it's not a sin that you commit. It's a sin that's that you're born with. It's not a problem you can fix by changing your behavior. So the, the, main, the, the main core of that, that problem, fundamental imprint, is me. Okay, that's, you know, a lot of uh, skeptics and a lot of critics of Christianity will ask, oh, if God is such a loving God, you know, why is there pain? Why is there suffering? You know, what's the deal? If there's a tree, why did God make the tree? These questions, just not, not understanding. You know, I, not that I understand it fully myself either, but from what I see, the tree isn't, a, it's not a God playing a game. It's not God having a joke. It's God giving us the out. You know, it's, it's a sign of God's love. I love you. I make you in my image. I give you everything. It's yours. I love you through and through because you're mine. You're made in my image, but there's the door if you want it. That's how much I love you. I'm not going to force you to obey me. I'm not going to force you to believe me. There's the door. And pain and suffering is not something God created. It's something we did, accurately speaking. We disbelieved. We sinned. Adam, our representative, he's the one who ruined it. But God, in his great love for mankind from the beginning before creation, knew that that was going to happen because he's God. Amen? And he had a perfect plan. See, that's what blows me away, right? The perfect plan from the beginning was the gospel. So that we can, he can make that relationship again with man. So now that with, by, through the work of Christ, even though we still pick at that tree every day, we sin and fall every day, it's been covered by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So the tree was God's love too. But Satan still works the same way, tempting the first man and first woman the same way he's, he's, he attempts tempts us the same way too. It's make, make it about me, me, myself, and I. Genesis chapter 6. The age of Nephilim, just um, money, um, 
what is it, materialism, just everything materialistic. These are things that are imprinted in us too. That's what the world teaches. If you just get that car, you're going to be happy. You just get this or that. Genesis 11 is success, the Tower of Babel. It's the same principles that's imprinted, you know, that we're taught when we're young. It becomes our roots, Acts chapter 6, Acts 13, 16, and 19. It's become part of the culture. You know, people go all over the world and visit huge shrines and temples and take pictures. You know, it's a cultural thing, you know, and they don't understand what's happening there. But this, the strategy of Satan and Genesis 3, 6, and 11 trickling down into the culture, it's become a culture in nations controlled by that. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul writes that too, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Um, but against the rulers of this world, this dark world, the force of darkness in the heavenly realms. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, there are diseases, afflictions brought upon by demons. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this age has blinded non-believers using culture. Oh, don't believe it. Why, why are you going to church, man? Just, you know, live life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> When you're sharing the gospel to a non-believer and they're not hearing the gospel, it's not because you're not presenting it in a correct way. It's because they're blinded. Until that darkness is broken. And, I mean, it's ridiculous why they can't see that, though. Isn't it? I mean, to me and you, right? If their evidence is there. Jesus is a real person. Amen? He really died on a cross. He really bodily resurrected. And we have a whole church history of Christians dying by the thousands, even today, by the way, all over the world. I mean, there's so much evidence. But a non-believer will take that evidence and be like, oh, man, that's some big guys made that up, man. You know, like, what's going on there? They're being blinded. Caught in this world, the way the system works, living for money, living for success, whether they know it or not, just all caught in Satan's deception. And this has trickled down not only to the culture, but to individuals, the six states of the non-believers, to the individuals, and to their families and in their homes. Okay, this is the extent of where Satan works. He's worked from the beginning, he works in the culture and brings it into the individual and brings it into the home. That's why there's so many problems. So that's why you and I don't need to do something grandiose. It's not something that we have to do. What we have to do, if anything, is focus on the word, okay? And the word's core being not only just the gospel, but only the gospel. Now, why do we say only the gospel? We don't say only the gospel, meaning that's the only thing that you have to hold on to and don't look at your neighbor, don't do anything else. And, you know, that's not what only gospel means. Only gospel means that this is the only answer for this problem. Religion is a good thing. Religion, if you don't have religion, you have more people out on the street hungry. You have more alcoholics who don't have places to go have AA meetings. You have people that are um, in third world countries that don't have homes. Religion is a good thing. If you don't have religion, you're going to have more chaos. Right? That we have to be very clear about that. We don't want to, if someone has another religion, we're not saying that the religion is bad. It's good natured, good purpose. It's, they want to do good things, but it's not going to solve this problem though. No matter how many bowls of soup you give to somebody, it's not going to solve the problem of Satan, sin, and being separated from God. It cannot. Amen. So that's why it has to be only the gospel. I'm sorry if I raised my voice there. I normally don't do that, but sorry about that. I'm just frustrated. I just, it's a big scar, you know? Only Jesus. And it's good news. You know, people that criticize Christianity, they just don't get it. They don't understand the gospel. The gospel is not something that's narrow-minded. It's not... It's not unfair or not all-encompassing. It's for everybody. The gospel is good news. The good news that this problem that's unsolvable is solved through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's good news. Amen? Amen. So it has to be only Jesus because he says it himself. Jesus says, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If it's not only Jesus, you have to change the Bible. Mainstream Christianity today would tell you, don't, don't say that. Don't say it's only Jesus. That's, that's not Jesus' message. That's not the message of love, you know. It's, we have to be embracing. We have to be inclusive of everyone. Just we have to love everyone. The Muslim, the Hindu, we're all going there. It's just a different way. If that's the truth, then you get to change the Bible. You have to change the words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth. He doesn't say I'm one way and there's another way. He says, I am the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's good news. Amen? If he said, I am one way and the other way is you got to do these things or you can go that way or do that way, that's not good news, guys. He says, I have come. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As our true priest, he comes as the ultimate sacrifice because somebody has to pay Romans 3 10 9 and 23 there is no one righteous not even one no one who does good not even one for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God Romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death okay. so that has to be paid so Jesus comes and on our behalf he pays the ransom he pays it through his blood. Okay. That was his mission. He came, he healed, he did a lot of good works, he did all those things because he saw the physical need of people. Amen? Right? He saw the physical need. They were hungry, so he, f he gave them food. They are sick, so he healed them. But that's not why he came. He did all those things along the way of his real mission. His real mission was come and die and be nailed to a cross. And he knew that the whole time. 1 John 3, 8, the reason why the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. Amen? Amen. So he utters on the cross three words. It is finished. Okay, this is the covenant of Calvary, in other words. Of the 21 things, this is the first and most important part. He comes and he does the work. Fully, completely. Amen? He doesn't like, okay, I did almost all of it. Your turn. You know? He f completely finishes the work of Christ. And if you believe that, John 1, 12, yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen? Amen. If you're a child of God, that's it. When you, I know we keep hearing it, so it becomes kind of, it's kind of numb to us. I'm a father now, so I can understand just a little bit, maybe, of how that works. But God hasn't called us. He doesn't love us because we do something for him. He doesn't love us because he's even expecting us to do something for him. He loves us because we're his children. I mean, I'm not the best father, but I'm not the most, I don't think, you know, I don't expect my kids to, like, give me something later. I'm not, like, calculating in my mind, like, oh, yeah, I got two kids now. All right. Hey, do something for me. You know what I mean? Like, when I get old, they're going to, bam, or give me money. And then that's why I have my kids. You know what I mean? You know, I can taste it a little bit. I love them. Why do I love them? Because they're my kids. That's it. That's all they need to know. It's not because they do something for me. That's not because they, you know, because they listen to me. The reason why I love them is because my relationship with them, period. That's all they need to know. All I want them to know is that I love them. That's how it works. I mean, how, that's it on a human level, but imagine God's love for us in that regard. He loves us simply as we are. Okay. I mean, he's not jumping up and down when we're not doing what he wants, but he's still not loving us any less. Amen? John 5, 24, we have crossed over from death to life. Okay, it's done. Okay, so all we have to do, first and foremost, is enjoy. I believe that to be God's ultimate heavenly mandate, is to enjoy. You know, we love our neighbors, um, love God, love our neighbors, absolutely, we have to do that. But how? 
how. Okay. I believe that God does not want that to be forced. I believe that God doesn't want that to be our duty. I believe that God doesn't want that to be something that we have to do on our own strength. I believe God wants that so natural. Not a duty, but as a result. Remaining in him like as a natural fruit. You know, not like, oh, I hate my neighbor, but I'll say I love you. <laughs> I love you. You know, that's not what, and I did what God wants. That, he's not up there with the, with the like, a, okay, yeah, he's loving his neighbor. All right, good job for my, yeah, good merits. You know, he's not up there like calculating, you know. All he wants us to do is enjoy what he's done for us. As we naturally enjoy that, you don't have to tell yourself to love your neighbor. You know what I mean? It's not a duty to go share the gospel with somebody. It's like food, you know? I, I, I always correlate it with food. When you eat good food, you don't have to force yourself to tell somebody about it. This is the first, man, yo, man, last night I had this bomb Mexican food, man. <laughs> so good. The, oh, my gosh. The torta and the way that they made it, the melted the cheese and they put the sauce in and the slices of the marinated asada in there. And the, oh, my gosh, it was, man. You know, you don't have to coerce yourself to tell somebody about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I believe that God's ultimate first priority is that you enjoy the word. You enjoy the gospel. You enjoy that it's finished. And a great illustration of that is Luke chapter 15. If you turn with me there, Jesus is trying to explain how this works. He's trying to explain it to Pharisees and the religious people of that time. And I believe we have a lot to also relate to in this passage as well. That we have, I, have, I used to just relate to just the prodigal son, but I realized, you know, there's so much of the older brother in me too. But in this passage, the tax collectors and sinners were gathering, and Jesus was there with them. He was going to have share a meal with them, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were like, "Man, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They're not, they're not getting it." So what Jesus says, he's speaking to them, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and he gives them three. Three parables. Okay. Janet, come in. Welcome. Three parables. And there's three. You're, you're fine. No badness. It's just goodness. Okay. Three parables. And the characteristic, the common characteristics of these three parables, if you look, is that there's three lost things. There's a lost sheep. There's a lost coin. And there's a lost son. Are you, are you familiar with Luke 15? So he's giving three parables, three examples, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. And the characteristics that they're found. The sheep was lost, but then found. The coin was lost, but then found. The son was lost, but then found. And the point of those three common characteristics of those three things is that there's a celebration. So the sheep was lost and the person, this is a parable that Jesus is explaining. The sheep was lost and then he finds the sheep and he calls his neighbor and says, hey, the sheep was lost, it's found, let's celebrate. The coin was lost, let's celebrate. And the last one is the, the ultimate point. The son returns. The father is waiting every single day from far away, meaning when someone from far away, that means he was always waiting for him every single day. He runs, embraces him, and he restores him, doesn't punish him, doesn't you know, do anything. He restores him and he throws a feast for him, kills the fattened calf, <laughs> right? That's Jesus, the lamb is slain, and there's a celebration. And the whole point of that story, it's actually quite a sad story, is it's the older brother. Okay. The Pharisees don't know that, that he's talking about them. So there's the older brother, he comes back off from the hard work of, you know, he came back doing the hard work. He comes back and then he hears the celebration. He hears the celebration. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Africa, but it reminds me of Africa. Africa, when they praise, they may take it down. <laughs> yeah! Oh! You know, and I'm, I'm just like, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm starting to move like this, and then after a while, I'm, I'm doing it too. I'm like, <laughs> but Jesus, that's how he explains this thing that's happening inside the house. There's music and there's celebration, and he hears that. He's like, whoa, what's going on? And the servant comes and says, oh, your, your, your brother that was lost is now home, and your, your father has killed the fattened lamb, and there's a celebration. Right, that's God's, that's the gospel. He's killed the fattened lamb. He opens up this banquet that all he wants us to do is, hey, come in. You, you, you made a mistake. You, you, you threw my money away. You spit in my face. You walked away from me. That's okay. 
just come back. It's right here. Just come on. And the older brother who could not go in. Now look at, if you just, don't take my word for it. Look at what the Bible says here. Okay? The older brother, 28, okay. 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called in one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, your father has killed the fattened lamb because he has been very, okay, safe and sound. And then the older brother, what has happened in verse 28? The older brother doesn't enjoy. What does the older brother do? He becomes angry. What? He becomes angry. So what, is, what happens? His father comes out and says, yo, come on, man. Just come in. And why can't he go in? Not because of the things that he was ashamed of or like, you know, we talked about the first session, right? Because of the things that he's done. Look, Father, I've done everything you commanded me to do. I've worked hard for you. I've done everything for you. But not once have you done this for me. He's just completely missing the point. He couldn't go in because of the good things that he's done. Okay, whatever is going on in your life, good or bad, it can be a hindrance from you from enjoying the gospel. Oh, I've done, I've, I've evangelized 20 people, and I, I, I've done that. I, last week I brought somebody in there, you know, I, you know, you know, you know, like, you know, that can be a block too. Have you made a mistake? You have something in your past or something you've done that's shame, that you, sh you feel shameful for, you feel guilty? That can be a block too. All of those things, good or bad, you just got to leave it at the door and just come in, okay? It's done. Amen. Our relationship with Jesus and God is that we're his children. So all we have to do is come into the banquet and just eat. Is that so hard to do? It's hard because we're not used to that. But I bless you in Jesus' name from today that you begin to enjoy. That's all you have to do. Um, I told you about the encourager. This encourager... Um, was married to a non-believer for oh, I don't know how many years. This was this happened last year. I don't know if I shared with this, this with you last time, but her husband is alcoholic. Never physically abused her, but verbally, emotionally, all the time, all the time. And she was going through it, and she had it. She she was fed up, and she asked one of my coworkers, pastors at the church, um, pastor, you know, I think I have to get a divorce, you know. And the pastor's like, well, you know, that can be God's plan too. Um, but let's pray about it. How about just one more time we try to approach him and share the gospel? So she said, okay, fine. One more time. <laughs> one more time. You know. So uh, the pastor comes over to the house, but he's late. You know, just sometimes our meetings go longer. But anyway, he's late. He's too late. He gets there, and uh, her husband had already passed out. Came home drunk, passed out. And the encourager was like, oh, Pastor, you're too late. He's already passed out. You know, Pastor! You know? <laughs> and this was God's plan. This was God's plan. So they started to talk and have team ministry and have forum. And through the course of that forum, she realized, you know, what we shared before, that she was not really enjoying. Mm -hmm. That it was still about her, only her. My pain, my suffering, why can't he do that for me? Why is he like that and I have to go through this suffering and this pain and me and me and me? And she realized that she had not really enjoyed and she went even further than that. She realized that she had never really, really prayed for him. She was praying for her. You following me? Heal him of his disease so I can be freed. <laughs> like, you know? She realized she had never really put herself in his shoes, and it broke her down, you know? She realized that all she had been doing was, oh, you came home and, ah, oh, Satan, you should be ashamed of yourself, you know? You should go to church like me and, you know, Satan, or, you know, like she was, that's all she was doing, is just, you know? She had never thought of the disease, the pain, the suffering that her husband was going through. And then she started to realize that if not for her husband's disease and pain, she, had, she would have never came to the gospel. She would have never came to the gospel. She would have stayed a non-believer. But because of that pain, suffering that was inflicted on him and on her, I mean, she, both of them, that's why she found the gospel. That was her kind of way. So the next morning, she cooked this really good hejangkuk. 
uh, pork bone soup. It's a very famous hangover soup that's made by Koreans. Like, it's really good. I mean, the pork just falls off the bones. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> but if they make it good, of course, bad restaurant will make it bad. But she brings it out, and, you know, he's like, what, what's going on? What, what, you never cooked this, you know, for me. And then she said, yo, bo. She's like, honey, I'm so thankful. <laughs> you know, today's Sunday message, right? So thankful. He, she's, he's like, what? What are you talking about, thankful? And then, you know, he says, she says, I'm so sorry. I'm thankful for you because if not for the suffering and disease that you have, I would never have found the gospel. Right? And I'm sorry that I have not prayed for you more and tried to understand you. Here, honey. <laughs> He's just like, oh, what's going on here? What the heck's going on? Then the next couple of weeks, I, I don't know, you know, the, make a long story short, he, he starts coming to church. Um, they're both at church now, very strong churchgoers. Okay. But that can happen too. You can just understand the message and, and, and enjoy the message and it's just for you. It can just be for you, but that's not where God's heavenly ultimate mandate lies. But you have to enjoy. Amen. Only the gospel, and then only the kingdom of God. When we, when we enjoy the gospel, naturally, the kingdom of God comes upon us. In other words, the kingdom of darkness will break. Okay. Um, mainly me. My centered thinking, my standard, my me, 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 me. These, these are the things that start to crumble down. And Jesus, for 40 days, he speaks about the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Why the 40 days? The number is not important, as Pastor Song, Song, um, Song shared today. It's not the number that is important, but why 40 days? Because imprints, what's imprinted and rooted in their nature, he needed that time to try to change it. Because they were still so focused on physical things, their scars, the, their nation of Israel being colonized by Rome. They were so scarred by that. Still, their chosen na nation ideology that it's only Israelites and not for the world. For 40 days, he tried to explain to them. I'm trying to work on a 40-day habit of exercise. Chill. You know, I can do one or two days, three days, but you know what I'm saying? It takes about 30, 40 days to make it a habit, right? That's what you need. We need, we need to form a team. Amen, three today's team. Let's do it together, right? <laughs> okay. But for 40 days, he talked about not the physical pains or physical change, but he talked about the spiritual background. Okay. The kingdom of God is what? It's a, the spiritual background. Okay. It's our background. Okay. He talked about within that kingdom, instilling them the proper identity and authority. And he gives them the heavenly mandate and mission. He explains to them what the kingdom is, what the real kingdom is. There's a kingdom of darkness. People are worshiping idols. Rome is worshiping idols. They're all caught in religion, idolatry. All this culture is all darkness. And you guys have to go into that culture. You have to go into that world and you need to share about the kingdom of God, the gospel. You need to block those disasters, and they're not going to like you. Okay? But after these 40 days, they're ready. Like they get it. Oh, man, I finally get it, Jesus. I finally get why you came. You died on the cross. You rose from the dead. I get the mission now. I get it. And then what does Jesus tell them to do? He doesn't just send them. He gives them the way that God works is he gives promise, and he fulfills. He tells them. Okay, now, now that you know the mission, now wait. Okay. Wait for the promise the Father has promised for the Holy Spirit. So that's why it's only the Holy Spirit. Okay. He says wait. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Amen? A lot of people just want the power. 
you will see power, power. Amen. You know, for what? What do you need the power? I don't know. Just give it to me. I don't know. Just give me the power. I want the power. You know, pray for blessings, financial blessings. Pray for healing. Okay, that's great. You, God can do all those things. But for what? Why do you need the power? They leave out the most important part. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Okay, witnesses of Christ, of the gospel. Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples of all nations. Jesus ministered to the crowds, but always ministered to the disciples separately. Mark chapter 16 through 15 through 20. He gives us authority to go into the world and bring healing. Guys, a lot of people need healing. A lot of, lot of people. Because there's just caught in this. Okay. Imprints, roots in nature, all just saturated in, in Satan's strategies and darkness and so scarred and hurt so many hurt people out there for these are just these are just the message of Jesus before he ascended okay. feed my lambs remnants Peter what a guy I love Peter like I can relate to him so well man he's such an awesome guy he was all talk. Jesus, no, I'm going to die before you die. And then he denies Jesus three times. And what does he do? Goes back to his old job, his old ways. Imprint, root, and nature, you know. He just go fishing. <laughs> you know? And Jesus comes and finds him and says, do you love me? And, and Peter responds, yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. And the third response is the response that he was looking for. Lord, you know I do. Amen. And then he says, okay, good. Got it. Feed my lamps. Okay. Okay. I bless you in Jesus' name that you restore, restore your thanksgiving. Don't worry about what you will wear, what you will eat, because your Father in heaven knows. Okay? Don't worry about that. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen? The gospel and evangelism. Okay? And all these things will be added unto you. And don't get that verse wrong either, you know? All these things! Hallelujah! If I do this, then I'll get all these... No. The kingdom and righteousness, that's enough. When we really understand the gospel and God's kingdom, it's enough. The other things are a bonus. Amen? Joseph wasn't praying to be governor. That was just like, okay. You know, he, he had received all of his answers already. Okay? So restore your thanksgiving today, okay, through prayer. Matthew 6, And I love how Jesus, when he, the disciples were like, hey, how do we pray? How do we pray? I mean, he just he tells them, all right, all right, this is how you pray. Why don't you do, pray like this? And the Lord's Prayer starts out. Yeah. It starts out with the gospel. Our Father, who art in heaven. Who is God? He's our Father. And just try starting that way. My Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Okay. So begin to try to deeply meditate on God's word. Okay. Namely the gospel. Your worries, your concerns, your life. The Bible says God knows about that. He knows. Okay. Especially this year's RCA message, try to hold on to that. Secondly, try to memorize the Word. The Word of God is your weapon. 
You know, it's your weapon. Jesus himself, when being tempted by Satan, he fought the devil in Matthew 4 with the word. Three times, the devil came and said, look, 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 look. And Jesus said, he could have just said, get out of here because he's God. But he referred to the word. He said, it is written. It is written. It is written. So that's why the word is so important because it's our weapon. And I used to play Counter-Strike back in the day, you know. When you ran out of ammo, you're just you're jumping through a corner, you know. If you know someone doesn't have a weapon, right, it's, it's, you're not afraid. I think I used this example a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but memorize, you know. John 1.12, do you have it memorized? You know, in your prayer time, instead of holding on to your worries so much, try to, try to hold on to the gospel, hold on to God's word. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed. Not to all who are perfect, not to all who pray hard, not to all who go to church every week. No, no. Yet, yet to all who receive and believe. He gave the right to become. He gave the right to become children of God. And lastly, try to meditate, especially on your Sunday message. Okay. We received a message today from the servant of God, but I believe that each individual, that's why church is so important. You know, it's not for a guilt trip if you can't go to church every week, but the reason why church is so important is that some, when you come to church, it's the place where God speaks to his body, his people at one time and gives a specific message to the individual. Now how, you know, Ashua, I can't think of the Korean uh, English word. Man, it's, I've been in Korea too long, I think. Ashua, how, at a loss would you be if you, you're on there on Sunday, you get the message, and then it's just, it just stays in your notebook? You know, how, that's be so silly. If God's speaking to you directly on Sunday, you come to church on Sunday and God's speaking to you directly. He's, he wants to guide you through that word throughout the week. He wants to bring life into you throughout the week through that word. What a shame would it be to just leave it at your notebook? So as we pray to make the three three today teams and this eight pardon, eight mission team, step one is just the word, the gospel, and your Sunday message, your pulpit, Thanksgiving, right? Gaius and Thanksgiving. I don't know what message God gave to you specifically, but organize it, find it, hold on to it. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Uh, let me give you a second, uh, maybe try to sit up straight. I don't know if, this, if you ever tried this. Don't, you know, don't pray yet. Try to sit at the edge of your seat and put both feet kind of separately. Okay. Try to put your posture straight.